from Renaissance-style chateaus. Grand country estates. Architectural glass masterpieces. These are the remarkable homes. My goodness. And magnificent landmarks. One day, my son, all this will be yours. At the very heart of Britain's spectacular history. Oh, this is stepping back in time. Join me no! and a host of celebrities. I can't believe people lived here. With a passion for the past. <laughs> it really is a little hidden treasure, isn't it? As we travel the length and breadth of the nation. This is really exciting. With unparalleled behind-the-scenes access. Would you like to see um, some of his speeches that I brought from the archive in no, Cambridge? No, yes! <laughs> from the highest heights. That's a heck of a view from up here. To the deepest depths. <laughs> We've got stalactites here. We'll uncover the secrets. Here he is. Oh! Still hidden within these breathtaking buildings. It's good job I'm slim. <coughs> These are the places that nobody else gets to see. And explore the riches. It's so big, it's so intricate, it's so beautiful. And treasures of one of our most loved institutions. Welcome to the Secrets of the National Trust. On the banks of the River Thames in southwest London, sits the magnificent Ham House in all its 17th century splendor. It was home to the resolute Murray family through one of the most turbulent centuries in British history. Ham House is the story of the power of the crown, of civil war, political maneuverings, and the woman who came out on top. Elizabeth Murray grew up at Ham, Born into a royalist family, she was politically daring and unforgivingly ambitious, devoting her life to fighting for Ham's very existence. A determined heiress, Elizabeth did everything she could to keep hold of this house, which made her one of the most outstanding women of the 17th century. by uncovering rarely seen royal gifts. This is something the public never get to see. A present from King Charles I. Exposing hidden relationships. So she charmed the Lord Protector. There were all sorts of rumours at the time that they had an affair. And unveiling supernatural goings on. Oh, goodness. She's not the only ghost here, then. Oh, by no means. I'll discover that Ham's story goes right to the heart of the English Civil War. Ham House is a fitting tribute to Elizabeth Murray's ability to survive this turbulent time. Also tonight, Oz Clark is in Staffordshire to uncover a house that saved the future King Charles II. He was the most wanted man in the country. The punishment for treachery in those days was to be hung, drawn and quartered. And Ronnie Archer Morgan is on the trail of another enterprising woman who left her mark on the buildings of Britain. She was a shrewd innovator, yeah. operating in a man's world, which in those days was really, really something. This glorious house on the banks of the River Thames was Elizabeth's home from where she exploited her family background, intelligence, wit and beauty, becoming famed for her political influence, almost unheard of for a woman in the 1600s. Her rise to the very top of society wasn't without its rewards. Elizabeth spent the spoils of her success on almost doubling the size of Ham House, creating the triumph we see today. These extensions left behind some incredible secrets, and I'm meeting surveyor Tim Mason, who's sending me between the walls here at Ham to discover them. Just how radical were Elizabeth's designs then and alterations for Ham? Well, Elizabeth and her husband had some really big plans for Ham and added the whole of the south wing. That's a lot. It is, and their designs incorporated much of the original property, and many of the features from the old building can still be seen in the house today. Where are we now? Is this part of it? Uh, we're on the first floor in a yeah. storeroom, as you can see, <laughs> um, but this was once a bedchamber, and the couple's designs left some really interesting secrets behind. And there's one round here which I'd like to show you. Really? Elizabeth's radical extensions 
conceal a valuable piece of history. Most definitely not on the visitor route. Through here? Yes. Where? Just down, just down here. Down there? Yes. Squeeze down. It's a good job I'm slim. <laughs> <laughs> Where am I going? Keep moving down right to the end. And just look above your head, there's uh, a brass knob. If you give that a pull. This? Yes. Oh. Oh, gosh. A lump of brick wall? <laughs> <laughs> there is, but there is also a magnificently preserved uh, 17th century painted mural sundial, which is a very rare example. It's been covered up for almost 350 years. So Elizabeth built on this lump out here. This was the original outside wall? Yeah. There's a four up at the top. That's the 4am line. So you'd only see that one in summer. <laughs> Height of summer. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. And there's a, a legend on it, Vig, Vigi something. That's the beginnings of the motto, Vigilate et Orate, which means to watch and pray. And the dial is also dated 1622. So if Elizabeth hadn't done the extension and covered that up... No it would have disappeared. Exactly. The weather would just have worn it away. Absolutely, yes. Behind the door, a, a secret glimpse into the past. Indeed. The secret sundial isn't the only unexpected thing left behind at Ham. Rumour has it, the house is a hotbed of paranormal activity. Volunteer Pauline Robertson is here to spook me into believing that the eerie corridors of Ham are haunted by the lady of the house, Elizabeth Murray, who apparently never left. The Duchess's bedroom. Goodness me, a privilege to be allowed in here, really, isn't it? It is. So yes. Does she really haunt the place? Oh, absolutely, yes. She's heard, she's smelt, <laughs> and she's felt. So how is she heard? What does she do? Well, she had metal-heeled shoes mm. on a stick, so you could hear the shoes Click, click, clicking and the stick tapping along the corridor and the stairs. What about being smelled? Huh? Well, she used rose water perfume, and many visitors and staff say they smell it, particularly on the staircase. And felt? Well, very recently, a member of staff was locking up after a ghost tour and felt a breath on her ear and. <laughs> so, it seems that she's still in the house. She was obviously very reluctant to leave the place. Oh, it. absolutely. I mean, this was her pride and joy. Has anybody actually seen a ghost? Well, yes, some people have reported seeing a, a lady in black, certainly. I'm looking at your earrings. It wasn't you, was it? <laughs> what about these stories about mirrors? Elizabeth followed fashion, and mirrors became newly available to those with money. Looking glasses. Exactly. Mm. Well, many volunteers, including me, don't like to look in the looking glass, because they're not sure they'll see themselves, but... Might see her. Well, yes. it'd be rather exciting. Good afternoon, Your Grace. It's been very nice being with you, if you're there. Elizabeth's spirit may have remained, but to survive here in the first place, she had to negotiate a century that was filled with chaos and change. Ham House is a stunning 17th century mansion in southwest London. It was the home of Elizabeth Murray, famed political manipulator and a truly remarkable woman. But to understand Elizabeth's action-packed life here, you must go back to her childhood, to her father William's and her mother Catherine's unusually intimate connection with the King. I'm meeting historian Sarah Gristwood. Sarah, what a grand 17th century welcome. We're in Ham's Great Hall to find out more about this curious regal relationship. Isn't it an amazing house? Well, it's grand, but it's not intimidating, is it? It's not vast. Although it's not huge, this is a senior courtier's house. Yeah. They say it's one of the finest 17th century survivals in Europe. I can believe it, the gilded cornice and the balusters all the way round. It's wonderfully elegant. And when you come in that front door, you know, oh, this is the house of someone classy. Absolutely. Although they were a family on the rise, rather than one who started out at the very top of the tree. Now, who are the two 
Roman gods above the fireplace, then? They're Mars and Minerva, but in fact, they're also William Murray and his wife, Catherine Bruce. So they put their statues up there and said, we are Roman gods. That's right. Now, William Murray, he wasn't from the very grandest of families, but crucially, his uncle became tutor to the young Prince Charles. And the young Prince Charles, of course, would become Charles, Charles the I. I. He's in at court. He's very much in at court. It's even said that he was Prince Charles's whipping boy. Oh, that's a bit unkind. <laughs> so how can you become his whipping boy? Did they grow up together then? They were very much of an age. The theory runs that a prince was too grand to be beaten by his tutor, as all other schoolboys were. So he had a courtier, a whipping boy, who took the punishment on his behalf. Well, if you oh. ended up with a house <laughs> like this, then presumably it was worth taking the flack a yeah, bit, was it? absolutely. So this is the environment in which Elizabeth grew up. Not bad. She was born the year that her father acquired the house, so she'll absolutely have grown up knowing and loving it. She would have had a taste for the finer things in life then. Which never left her. <laughs> Elizabeth's father, William Murray, went on to serve the king as a gentleman of the bedchamber, a very senior royal aide. And in a sign of how highly he was valued by Charles I, he was rewarded with the lease of Ham House. It clearly paid to be the whipping boy. As the eldest of three girls, Elizabeth was the heiress. William Murray treated her like a son, she benefited from a full classical education and her father's cosy relationship with the king. And here we've got something that absolutely proves how close William was to the king. Gosh. Look at this. This is something the public never get to see. Beautiful. A Bible? No, it's the Book of Common Prayer. But this and is the most elaborate cover, which, when it was new, would have shone. It looks like silver and gold thread. Absolutely. Metal, the work embroidery from the king's own embroiderer. And of course, we can see here CR, Charles Rex. So, the personal gift from the king to William Murray. Commissioned by him. Can yes. we look inside it? We can. I have to be very careful as I'm not allowed to touch the metal work there. Right. Okay, there. What have you got? The Book of Common Prayer. Yes, here we are. 1625. Oh, well, there you are. That really rather proves the point, doesn't it? A present from King Charles the I. Wow. This is something very spectacular. This is a real treasure for the house. Yeah. Can you imagine that? When it was first minted, and they must have left it out to show off. Yes, I think if you had something like that, then... You'd want to show you'd it. You'd want to make sure everybody knew about it. It proves beyond any doubt whatsoever that this was a household that was on intimate relations with the king. It does. Elizabeth grew up in a wholly royalist household. Her father, William, was one of Charles I's closest confidants. He was renowned for his vengeful temper and cunning. These qualities were clearly admired by the king, who frequently employed him to attend secret meetings and arrangements that would further his political influence. But in 1642, civil war engulfed the country. The parliamentarians under Oliver Cromwell fought to overthrow the English monarchy, eventually executing King Charles I. William Murray was forced to flee, leaving behind his wife Catherine, to whom he'd shrewdly transferred the ownership of Ham House. She was left in charge of this impressive property, along with the teenage Elizabeth and her sisters. This female-dominated house was now in danger of being seized by the parliamentarians. It was up to Catherine to defend it. Curator Dr Jane Ead is taking me to Ham's Long Gallery to explain exactly how Elizabeth's mother Catherine was such a formidable force. It must have been a frightening time for royalist families yes. who were suddenly out of favour. Yes, absolutely. Because, of course, um, as supporters of the king, they're naturally opposed to Parliament. And the key thing is you don't want to be on the losing side and you need to protect your assets. Catherine is then here on her own. Yeah. Because William's away. Yes. Where's he? 
He's travelling a lot on the King's behalf and seeing the way things were going, he actually transfers formally, legally, the estates at Ham to Catherine and her daughters. She is now then in charge yeah. of Ham House. Yes, she is. What a responsibility. I think it was a huge responsibility. It was a really unsettling time. But well, you can see her here in this portrait. She looks an indomitable sort of Doesn't woman. You wouldn't she? argue yes, with her, would you? She looks a determined lady, yeah. I think. Presumably there was a danger of the house being seized by yeah. the parliamentarians. Yes, absolutely. And there was a farm here. I mean, it's quite a great estate. And the cattle, goods, all those sorts of things, good horses, are all the kinds of things that they would have wanted to take. So she was on very dangerous ground. She really was on dangerous ground, yeah. And here alone with her daughters. How did Catherine manage to hang on to her house in the face of all that opposition? She petitioned Parliament endlessly, ceaselessly, and in fact we have a really interesting early document at Ham, in, hidden in the archives, which proves just how good and successful she was uh, petitioning. And it's dated 1643, 1643 and it's a letter from the people in charge of seizing assets mm. and it essentially confirms that Catherine is going to be allowed plundered goods which were seized from Ham to be returned. At the Committee for Sequestration of the Estates of Delinquents and Papists in the County of Surrey, it's ordered that upon payment of £40 mm that Mrs Murray nor any of her tenants mm. or servants shall not be hereafter molested or troubled mm -hmm. for the said goods. Yeah. So she's paid £40, yeah. which is a considerable sum of money then. Yeah. She's um, paid the money to get her own back. goods back. Yeah. But at least it means she's going to be left alone, at least for the moment. So Catherine has successfully defended Ham House. She's yes. hung on to it. Yeah. Did she ever see William Murray then again? He'd gone off doing his works for the King. Did they see each other? They did. And in fact, rather oddly, given that she was suspected of passing money to the Royalist cause, they allowed her just after this incident to go and see William in Oxford, stay at the Royal Court. But perhaps they were hoping to catch her out. It's impossible to overestimate just how dangerous life would have been for yes. Catherine Elizabeth and the other sisters at that time. Yes. And yet, when you look into those eyes, you can see she's not a woman to be messed not with. That Catherine I... Murray, is she? I agree, yeah. I think she was tough. The trip to Oxford by the ladies of Ham House was a brave show of support for the Royalist cause. I'm returning to her opulent bedchamber with the Trust's Sarah McGrady to see a very special piece of Elizabeth Murray's luggage. So this is the sort of thing that they would have travelled with, is it, this strong box? Yes, it is. Strong boxes, by the very name, had to be strong. But it's beautiful as well as being practical. Very. Can we look inside? Yes, let's. So, it's, it's quite tricky and yeah. uh, finicky. We don't do this very often. Well, I'm very grateful. OK. So, We're it. in. Yep. Um, so we've got these lovely little semi-secret compartments. If we drop them down, uh, you can imagine papers being kept in there right. and various things like that. We lower this down onto this rest. All right. Ah, and you've got drawers. Silk tabs that um, we use to open it. So we'll open this very unassuming drawer. If you could hold that for me, that would be right. most appreciated. This is like a conjuring trick, isn't <laughs> it? Is. <laughs> What's going to pop up? Well, so there's a secret drawer here. Can you guess where it is? Presumably at the back, somewhere in there. It could be. Sometimes it is um, uh, in his cabinets, but yeah. no, this one is actually just Oh, here. now that's clever. It is, isn't it? You think that's a part of the structure? <laughs> and then, so we push this bit open. Ah, right. And then you could put in, yeah, whatever you want, really. So there's a hole there. So your jewels, your diamonds Absolutely. could go in there. Very clever. <laughs> so even though they were travelling, they would have wanted luxury goods to travel with. It's got to be posh. Yeah, they wouldn't have uh, dropped their standards too much. Imagine Catherine saying to Elizabeth, darling, don't let your standards drop in spite of the Puritans. <laughs> How arduous, Sarah, do you think that journey was to, to Oxford? I mean, very. Uh, times were very fraught, uh, so there were, would have been various dangers on the road um, anyway, and then to make matters worse, Catherine had to round up uh, five um, old nags. Why were there no decent horses? This was a wealthy family. Both armies were using all the good horses um, in the fighting. So there'd be no decent horses, nothing with four legs left here, really? <laughs> no, no, not really. William must have been pleased to see them when they got there. Absolutely. Uh, he'd been apart from them for, from a year already. So I think it was been a huge boost for him to have his family arrive. And if we come over here, I can show you why. Ooh. 
So this is so special. Uh, this is a miniature of Catherine Bruce, Elizabeth's mother, and it's in its original travelling case, made out of ebony. Can we open it? Yes, let's. So, go. Oh, look at that. How beautiful. Yeah. So whose was it? So this was William Murray's. It's a travelling case, so... <gasps> likely that he would have travelled into Scotland, to Oxford. And taken the picture of his wife with him and had it on his bedside table. So you can imagine him getting in from a hard day, trying to drum up royalist support for uh, Charles I, uh, and he pops it on his table, opens it up, and he sees his loving wife. This is the equivalent of the wallpaper on his mobile phone, then, the picture you have of your family. It is, you? isn't it? Yeah, it's, I think it's really lovely. It must have been a great comfort to him, but also he must have been very worried, knowing that he was in Scotland or Oxford or wherever. Catherine, Elizabeth and the other sisters are holding the fort here at home, worrying times. It's very different to nowadays. We can just phone each other to make sure that we're OK, but this is all that he had. Well, one thing that this proves for sure is that he missed her and his daughters. And it also proves, looking at that strong box over there, that they missed him. Catherine had so far won her fight for Ham. By July 1646, Parliament acknowledged she could keep hold of the estate. Elizabeth Murray had learnt important lessons from both her mother and father on how to navigate this challenging political climate. But while the civil war still raged, the future of Ham House could not be taken for granted. Sitting proudly on the banks of the River Thames, Ham House was home to the smart and resolute heiress Elizabeth Murray in the 17th century one of the most turbulent eras in British history. But Elizabeth wasn't the only determined woman to leave an indelible mark here at Ham House. The Father Thames statue that has adorned the front lawn here at Ham for over 200 years is the handiwork of craftswoman Eleanor Code. Ronnie Archer Morgan is in Lyme Regis to uncover just how Eleanor left such a memorable impression. I'm here in Dorset, following in the footsteps of an unsung hero of 18th century English architecture. Though largely forgotten today, the craftswoman Eleanor Code was a big deal in her day. She created Codestone, the versatile ceramic clay that features on some of Britain's most prestigious landmarks. I'm heading to Eleanor's former home, Belmont House to meet stonemason Philip Thompson, a leading codestone expert and restorer. Hi, Philip. Hello, Ronnie. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. What an amazing house, Philip. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Was this where Eleanor lived? This is where she lived some of the time. It was her seaside retreat. So all these details are in codestone, are they? Absolutely, yeah. All these embellishments would have been made in her factory at Lambeth. So exactly what is codestone? Codestone actually was an early form, an 18th century artificial stone. Yeah. It's a ceramic material and it's uh, a recipe that she inherited and then modified and uh, made better. 200 years later, her work still survives as good as it was when it left the kiln. So, mm. amazing. It looks, it looks to me as though it's as hard wearing as, as limestone or something. More so. More so? Yeah, definitely more so. In 1769, having perfected the recipe for her revolutionary Codestone, Eleanor went into business, establishing the Code Artificial Stone Company. So what was it about Code Stone that craftsmen liked at the time? Well, number one, I think, was the ability to achieve exquisite detail. It was an incredibly versatile material. If you had a particular design which was repetitive, you could reproduce it more easily or more cost-effectively than you could, say, uh, carving in stone. Well, she was a, a woman and a shrewd innovator, yeah. operating in a man's world, which in those days was really, really something. Eleanor's product was superior to anything else on the market, but it wasn't just the stone that made her business such a success. So what's, what have you got here, Philip? This is the uh, copy of the Code catalogue from the late 18th century and played a big part in the success of her marketing strategy. Ah, I see, yeah. And in, inside you'll see line drawings of the various items that she produced at the factory. Clever marketing. Nowadays, the use of code stone is a rare practice. Philip is one of the few people who figured out Eleanor's secret recipe, and he sculpts with it in his workshop today. 
Wow, I love that sphinx. Yeah, this is a piece of work we've just completed for a client. So I presume that this is the unfired codestone clay. Yeah, the principal ingredients are three types of clay. We have china clay, Devon ball clay, and fire clay. And we have flint, ground glass, and grog. Right, Ronnie, it's time to get our hands dirty and have a go. Oh, can't wait. So we put that into the mould, and then we press like this. So can I have a go? Should I just press that? Yeah, pressing it into all, all the crevices. All the crevices, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're much more dexterous at it than I am. I've been doing it for a few years, Ronnie. <laughs> the last piece of the jigsaw. The last piece. Normally we would leave this for a day, but we haven't got time. What we'll do is we'll give it a few minutes, we'll have a cup of tea, and then we'll come back and take them all Okay. Up. Okay, Ronnie, let's see your handiwork. My handiwork? Our handiwork? Oh, my oh, God. God. All things considered, you haven't done a bad job there, Ronnie. Look at that. No, it's good. Well, I've seen the real quality of Codestone, and obviously all credit. Yeah. to Eleanor Code. Absolutely, yeah. And Eleanor's spectacular work still takes pride of place here at Ham, a fitting testament to an incredible 18th century woman. But more than a hundred years earlier, another resolute figure would determine the very existence of Ham House. In 1649, Elizabeth Murray came of age. She was clever, witty, and opinionated. And she also now became the mistress of Ham. It was to be a chaotic year for Elizabeth. Her powerful mother died, and King Charles I had been executed. The imposing Oliver Cromwell and his army now had royalists like Elizabeth's father on the run. To ensure her survival and that of this grand house, Elizabeth would need to be politically astute. The Trust's Seri Meekins is taking me to Ham's still room, a space believed to be built especially for Elizabeth. So what exactly is a still room? Well, a still room is where all sorts of lotions and potions were distilled in order to make beauty treatments, cosmetics and medicines. So it wasn't just beer, ale and that kind of thing? Absolutely not. What would Elizabeth have done in here? Well, it's the one room in the house where Elizabeth would have worked alongside her servants. Oh. And we know that Elizabeth was very interested in medicine because there were lots of letters from Elizabeth to friends and family advising about their various ailments. So she would have made all sorts of ointments and cures, as well as uh, beauty treatments and cosmetics. What sort of ingredients would she have used? Well, we've got clove over there, would have been used for toothaches. Mm -hmm. You've got lavender. We've got lavender as well. Some rather but... suspicious looking snails. Yes. <laughs> Oranges. <laughs> and a hair dye made with bits of lizards and leeches. <laughs> Not a lot to call for that nowadays, <laughs> is there? I notice here we've also got the, the little um, Delights for the Ladies delights for book. Ladies. Delights for Ladies would have been full of housekeeping tips and, and beauty treatments. Just a minute, though. Take mice dung beaten in powder. Most ladies of big houses like this would have all sorts of family recipes. Oh, this is better, look. Um, a medicine for the headache. Take a handful of rosemary. Very handy. Two handfuls of betony. There we go, but we have mint because it's from the Bettany family, but we couldn't get any Bettany. So these are all near offer. It's near, near offer. Right, a spoonful of honey. A spoonful of honey. And settle them all in Malmsey. Malmsey, here we are. That's not a Malmsey. It's a Malmsey substitute. What is it? It's Pinot Grigio. Here <laughs> I love this 21st century <laughs> version. <laughs> and what? Wash your head there with... Oh, you wash your head with it? Yes. So let's, sure I'm let's have a little so go. Let's do this. Oh, goodness me. Now, while we're doing this, I've got to ask you about um, Elizabeth and the change of rule, because Charles I is beheaded, Cromwell, the parliamentarians, come to power. What's her relationship with Cromwell? Elizabeth was a survivor. She was a real pragmatist. She would have done anything that she could to make sure that her family held on to this property. 
Therefore, if a relationship with friendship with Cromwell was what was called for, that's what she did. So she charmed the Lord Protector, and she charmed Cromwell, didn't she? Well, we have no evidence of this, but there were all sorts of rumours that they had an affair. When he died in 1658, Elizabeth wrote to a friend that she knew him, and the wags at the time thought this was in the biblical sense. So she was, in effect, a double agent. There is a strong possibility that she worked for Parliament up until Oliver Cromwell died. After his death, she definitely spied for the Royalists. In this very still room, mm -hmm. Elizabeth made invisible ink to be used in her secret missives to the Royalists who were working in exile. So she's, as you say, she was a survivor. She was a survivor. Do you know, all this political manoeuvring is giving me a headache. Shall we try this remedy Well, and see why if it not? Works? Let us try. Oh, my God. I don't know the time. A bit of honey. In there, yeah. And then... Right. A little bit of the wine. A bit of the mum. A bit of the mum's And then Grigio. we mix it all up together. Right. And, uh, that's on the air now. It's well, I there. think that might be a bit of a mess. So I think we'll put some in here. Yeah. Now, you're going to be amazed by how quickly your head is going to go. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. There you go. On your forehead. Oh. That's right. It does smell nice. I don't know that it's working. I think this might work better. <laughs> Elizabeth was proving to be a very shrewd operator. Her relationship with Cromwell had helped her navigate dangerous political waters and safeguard her hold on Ham House. Ham House, a lavish 17th century mansion in southwest London, survived one of the most troubled periods in British history, the English Civil War. In the summer of 1651, the future Charles II marched an army against Oliver Cromwell to avenge the execution of his father, Charles I, and reclaim the throne of England. But at the Battle of Worcester, they were defeated, and Charles was forced to flee for his life. Now on the run, he was reliant on safe houses owned by loyal royalists. Oz Clark has travelled to Moseley Old Hall in Staffordshire, one of the places where Charles II hid while he was a king-in-waiting. This atmospheric Elizabethan pile is home to a dramatic story. I'm meeting Zoe Williams from the Trust to find out more. Zoe, this is a, a fantastic tale. Tell me more about it. Well, this was a very troubled time. Charles did lose the Battle of Worcester absolutely comprehensively. Uh, he was routed. He then had to escape and pretty much on his own was travelling around the countryside in disguise and trying desperately to get to France back into exile. So he'd be hiding during the day and travelling at night? Yes, the countryside was full of parliamentarian soldiers who were looking for the king. And Charles had to find people that were prepared to take him in, it was a massive risk for anyone to take. A devout Catholic in a Protestant Britain, Charles sought refuge where he could, searching out houses who practiced his faith and supported the king. Mosley Old Hall was one of the key homes to open its doors in his hour of need. So he was the most wanted man in the country. The Whitgreave family were taking a tremendous risk. Punishment for treachery in those days was to be hung, drawn and quartered. In the early morning of September the 8th, five days after the battle was lost, Charles arrived on this very doorstep, cold, exhausted, and in need of a place to hide. Nice old door. Yeah, we think it's the original door, and he remembered it nine years later, um, because he actually described it when he was in the ship as he was coming back to be restored to the throne. After days on the run, Charles was given dry clothes, food, and a proper bed. Ah, so this is where Charles II slept. That's right, but back in 1651, it was the uh, priest's room, Father Huddleston. The reason why this is, was the priest's bedroom is because we've got a cupboard next door to it, and in the cupboard is a secret priest hall, which is the safe place he can retreat to if danger threatens. So there's this hidden door with yet another door hiding behind it. OK. Down to your left, you can see where the hiding place is, under the floor. So bear in mind that Charles was six foot two, and um, this is quite a small, cramped space for him to get into. But it was vital for his safety. Here we go. 
Hey, that's not as difficult as I thought. God, it's not very big. Did the parliamentary forces get here? Yes, they did. So he had to scramble to get into there. So how close did they get? They were actually in the front garden, but they'd never actually searched the house. They never knew how close they were. The priest hole kept Charles safe while he was staying at Mosley Old Hall, but it was a local lady, Jane Lane, who eventually helped him flee the country. The Trust's Nicole Turner has some rare royal correspondence which sheds light on the King's eventual escape. So you can see down here in the corner that we've got Charles's signature there. And this is, I see, Paris, Monday the 23rd of 1652. Yes, so he was writing to Jane Lane while he was in exile in Paris. Uh, who was she and, and what did she do? Jane Lane was instrumental in taking King Charles uh, from here down to Bristol, where they were hoping to catch a ferry over to France. So King Charles was disguised as her manservant and he rode with her all the way down to Bristol over the course of about two or three days. Wow. So what exactly does the letter say? So the letter is saying that the king wants to reward Jane for her role in his escape. He says he doesn't have the means to do it while he's in exile, but as soon as he's restored to the throne, he would like to repay her for everything that she did for him. Eventually, he rewards her with £1,000, and then £1,000 every year after. Every year? Every year, yeah. It's a great amount in those times. It certainly was. Charles remained in exile in France for nearly a decade. He now waited in the wings for his chance to claim the throne. What an epic tale of royalty on the run. And what a fabulous place, too. Mosley Old Hall, the house that saved a king. Having ensured his survival and kept his head, the monarch in waiting would finally be able to return. Oliver Cromwell died in 1658, and just two years later, King Charles II was restored to the throne of England. And here at Ham, Elizabeth was victorious. The king rewarded her with a pension of 800 pounds a year for her services to the royalist cause, the equivalent of around £150,000 in today's money. She'd played both sides with great aplomb and once again guaranteed her survival. By 1660, Charles II was firmly on the throne. Elizabeth Murray's shrewd political manoeuvring paid off and Ham House was safe. Elizabeth married twice and had 11 children. She became a duchess and rose to the very top of society. And as the turbulent 17th century drew to a close, so did the life of the formidable Elizabeth Murray. She died aged 72 here at her beloved Ham House. Volunteer Pauline Robinson has already convinced me that Elizabeth haunts Ham, but she's back with a startling revelation. Her ladyship is not alone. Has Elizabeth been seen here in the round gallery? Does she occupy this? No, not so much here. It's more the stairs. Yeah. But we have other things associated with her here. What sort of other things? I mean, she, she's not the only ghost here, then? Oh, by no means, no. <laughs> Elizabeth and the Duke were great followers of royal fashion. They had a King Charles Spaniel. Now, did King Charles I really have King Charles Spaniel? Apparently, he had 29. Good gracious. And Elizabeth and the Duke had one. How do you know that? Well, now, if you'd like to lift this cloth, here he is. Oh, goodness. Where did he come from? Well, a casket smaller than this was found in the kitchen gardens yeah. ages ago. We now keep it in a storeroom, so it's not normally on display. Right. But does he then walk with Elizabeth around the house? Well, not with her, but he's heard and he's felt. Now, from time to time, visitors come up to one of us room guides. I thought dogs were not allowed in National Trust houses. Oh, no, sir, madam, no. But I've just seen one on the stairs. Oh, what 
sort of dog. Brown and white spaniel. No. And they don't know the story? No. Well, I mean, that's pretty sort of convincing, mm. isn't it? Yes. And some say, oh, a dog just brushed past me. Well, I'm just pleased Elizabeth's got some company, really. Go on, off you go. Find your mistress. Elizabeth was raised and died here amid the grandeur of Ham House, an heiress who mixed with royalty and enjoyed flaunting her success. But she'd lived a life of drama to get there, navigating her way through the civil war and the subsequent political chaos. Elizabeth prospered across a century where ideas were challenged, but she learnt the ultimate lesson from her parents, how to survive. Without Elizabeth, it's quite possible that Ham would still not be standing, and we would have lost Europe's finest example of 17th century fashion and power. Next time, I'm at Penryn Castle. This is an astonishing, here's me and here's my castle. An imposing Welsh fortress that's not what it seems. It's all smoke and mirrors, I'm afraid. I've been had. And a spectacular display of wealth and power. My goodness me. With a dark side. There's two rows of soldiers. If the crowd had moved, they would have to fire on them. And Floella Benjamin unearths a more humble stone dwelling. We still had people living in caves here in Britain. <laughs>